Hello and behind me is an Avro Vulcan bomber, which was a British long range, high altitude strategic nuclear bomber. And in this video, I'm going to take you on a detailed tour of it. First, I'm going to walk around the outside and I'm going to point out what makes it unique and interesting. Then we're going to climb into the cockpit and I'll show you through there as well. And then in the end, we're going to start the engines up and uh, run a whole lot of other different systems as well. And I can't wait to show you how it goes. So let's get into it. I'm Paul Stewart and I make videos about planes. This includes reviews and reports on board flights around the world and detailed tours through significant aircraft in museums. I've also made one video about music. If you're into these types of videos then please check out my channel and subscribe. And a huge thanks to the Vulcan to the Sky Trust for letting me film this aircraft. Everything I did and saw today can be experienced by anyone and I'll leave details of their website below. This actual aircraft was the first B2 or Mark II model which was the second main production variant that was delivered to the RAF and was also the last Vulcan to ever fly in October 2015. It's also a 200 series which makes a better howl which you'll hear soon. Starting at the nose is the in-flight refueling probe which was added with the B2 upgrade, thus increasing the range almost indefinitely. The Vulcan was about to be retired when the Falklands War started and there was a shortage of these probes so they actually borrowed a probe from a museum's Vulcan as it was still in good condition. It's been removed from this example but there was also a terrain following radar antenna under here. Initially this was designed to fly at high altitude but once it became evident that Soviet radars and missiles were operating up that high after Gary Powers was shot down in his Lockheed U-2, the Vulcan's role changed to fly very low and underneath radar so this system acted as a bit of a cruise control identifying terrain ahead and telling the pilot to either raise or drop the nose or it could even do that automatically with the autopilot. This was especially helpful if flying at night or even during the day as the forward visibility wasn't great. Inside the ray dome was the H2S radar unit and other electronic equipment. Down here is the pitot tube to measure airspeed. This bulge down here is the ventral bomb aiming blister although that wasn't used on the B2 aircraft as it was replaced with a more advanced bombing system. It was called the NBS or the Navigation and Bombing System which was an electromechanical computer that could guide the aircraft and then automatically drop the bomb with an accuracy of around 100 meters on a mission lasting thousands of kilometers. The window was kept as a backup if these systems failed and a visual drop was required and some Vulcans had cameras mounted here to assess the simulated bombing runs as well. Moving under here is the entry hatch and we'll be going in there later in the video. Here's the nose wheel and that strut looks incredibly sturdy. It was lengthened to raise the nose a little to provide the optimum takeoff attitude. Now have a look here from the other side when one of the engines is given full throttle and it squats down under the pressure. Moving up to the air intakes you can see the splitter plate. Now the air moving directly along the side of the aircraft surface called the boundary layer is rough and you want smooth air entering the engine. So this directs the boundary layer away from the intake. And they put this air to good use as it's vented in to cool the aircraft's electronic systems hidden in the wheel bay. The Vulcan was known for a signature howling sound heard at around 90% throttle. And it was from air moving through this air intake. In fact, here's that sound when one of the engines was given full throttle during the engine run that day. Let's talk more about these engines. There's four in total and here's two of the Bristol Sidley Olympus two spool axial flow turbojet engines lined up next to each other. These were upgraded over the Vulcan's life and while this never came with an afterburner or reheating as the Brits call it, this feature was designed into the engine for the TSR2 and Concorde. They powered the Vulcan to a max speed of Mach 0.92, although there were stories of them breaking the sound barrier, which seems completely likely given how slippery it does look. If you look closely at engine number 4, you'll notice that it's angled outwards a little. During testing, they found that the pilots had to keep putting in corrective yaw with the rudder, but by angling engine number 1 and 4 outwards in opposite directions, the angled thrust fixed the problem. 
Now the Vulcan didn't have any defensive equipment until the B2 upgrade, when this large pod was extended to include electronic countermeasure equipment. This works to confuse enemy radars, and examples include sending back incorrect radar returns to enemy receivers, suggesting that the aircraft is in a different location. Or if a missile is on the way, it sends back a lot of energy toasting its navigation systems. This underneath was just a warning system to let the crew know that they were rotating too fast and at risk of hitting the ground. Above this pod was the braking parachute, which was needed if the runway was 6,000 feet or less. Of interest, six Vulcans, including this one, were converted to become K2 tankers. And here's the refueling pod. It was later removed from this one, obviously. And at the top of the fin were more ECM antennas. Let's take a step back and have a look at this delta wing. On the wing's trailing edges, there are these eight elevons, which operate both as elevators and ailerons, which control pitch and roll. These are required as there's no horizontal stabilizers attached to the vertical stabilizer, as you see with most aircraft. The delta shape supports high-speed crews, although it is less effective at low speeds. Therefore, it requires a high angle of attack to generate this lift which means that the nose has to stick high up in the air during takeoff and landing. But to avoid the tail hitting the ground during this time, the landing gear struts had to be especially long so that the whole aircraft is raised higher off the ground. This also made it easier to load weapons and provide a respite from the weather for crews as this was a British aircraft. For comparison's sake, this Victor at Duxford has a more traditional wing and it's lower to the ground. But as well as the high speed efficiency, the delta wing is physically bigger, allowing extra fuel to be stored inside it. In fact, there's 14 fuel tanks with four in the central fuselage and five in each wing. Fuel is pumped between them to ensure the aircraft's center of gravity is maintained and auxiliary fuel tanks could be installed as you can see with this one in Duxford. Of interest, this deflection in the wing was not in the original prototype that actually had a proper delta wing with a straight leading edge. But they discovered that it could experience severe buffeting and reduce the top speed. By adding this kink in the leading edge and adding vortex generators, which are small fins above the wing, they resolved this problem. In fact, you'll see that the other large delta wing aircraft like the Concorde also have similar kinks in their delta wings. These are hard points here, which you could storm missiles such as the American Skybolt Air Launch Ballistic Missile. During the Falkland Wars, they also used these for other pods such as electronic countermeasures. The ECM pod at the rear was designed to counter Soviet technology, but the Argentinians were using Western technology such as that from the French. Therefore, the ECM would be far less effective, so they had to install different ECM suited to that. Here's the right main landing gear, which is interesting in that they've got two tyres for each wheel and the wheels themselves are actually quite small. For comparison's sake, here's the wheels on the TSR2, and these were designed to work on rough runways, and even grass if needed if there was a war and the runways were in a poor state. Now I suspect that the Brits realised how dependent they were on having perfect runways, therefore the requirements were changed with its replacement, which was going to be the TSR2. The engines would be started by a start cart using compressed air, and there was also a small Rover gas turbine auxiliary power unit or APU just behind the right landing gear door. This could generate power in flight if there was a failure with the main engines and could operate at up to 30,000 feet. Now above 3,000 feet, there was a RAT or a ram air turbine, which was essentially a propeller that would drop into the airstream and generate electricity. These were vital as the hydraulic systems were reliant on the electrical systems, otherwise they would lose control. The B1 model was meant to be able to fly on batteries for around 20 minutes, although there were still a few Vulcans lost. Let's have a look at the bomb bay. It could carry 21 1,000 pound conventional bombs or a single nuclear bomb. And with the B2 model, it could also carry extra fuel tanks as I've already shown you. This tube covered here in foil takes hot and pressurized air bled from the engines and provides the air conditioning to the crew. Looking directly above you is a mechanism involved with the electric air brake that you'll see activated in a few minutes. And right up the top there is the underside of the aircraft's upper skin. These green devices here are part of the hydraulic systems that I mentioned earlier, and the upside down bottle is an emergency hydraulic power pack, which has a motor that drives a piston to compress the fluid, thus maintaining pressure. There's oxygen and fire suppression bottles, which are self-explanatory. 
there's a number of white boxes and these are a part of the artificial feel system. Because the pilots have powered flight controls, they didn't get any feedback, therefore they wouldn't know if they're overstressing anything. So these boxes take information from the pitot tubes and use springs and return pressure to the controls for the pilots. Now this is interesting and it's hard to see, but up here is a little blue bit that were the wire looms for the rocket assisted takeoff, which wasn't actually put into production, but it was planned at one stage. Another really interesting thing is this circular line here, which would have been the cutout for the blue steel missile. And when the auxiliary fuel tanks were installed, as we see at Duxford, it also has the shape cut out. And here is that blue steel, again from Duxford, and it was a British air launched nuclear missile that could be launched by the V jets. It could be dropped by the aircraft well before they reach the Soviet Union and then fly itself at Mach 3 to their target while the aircraft returned to base. They were in service with the RAF from 1962 until 1970. And here's the Bombay doors operating as part of the engine run. I've got 17 minutes of raw engine run footage from multiple different locations and I'll link to that video below. Here are the electrically operated air brakes, which drop down to slow the aircraft. Once deployed, they have two settings, creating either medium or maximum drag, and you can see the two here. There's two of these underneath, although four were originally planned. And there were four on top, as you can see from this footage from the front. These can operate in flight or just after landing. And earlier I mentioned the RAT electrical generator propeller that will drop out of this red line panel during an emergency power failure. Just for interest sake, here is the Concorde's RAT so that it would be something similar to this. The Vulcan had a service ceiling of around 56,000 feet, so if there was an electrical failure at this altitude, it would be up to the RAT until they dropped to 30,000 feet where they could start the APU. But obviously, without engines, you wouldn't want to descend too fast as you may not be able to make that altitude up again. Well, that's the tour around the exterior of this aircraft, and now let's head inside. Here we are looking forward and underneath the cockpit. Straight ahead is the hatch to access the nose, with all of the equipment including the navigation systems in there. There's more equipment to the sides, and looking downwards is that blister that was originally a bombsite in the B-1 model. And here's a quick look upstairs, and we'll be moving up there shortly. Spinning around you have three crew positions. On your left and the aircraft's starboard side is the Navigator Radar Station, with most of the equipment removed as parts of this were used to keep other aircraft flying. His job was to coordinate the bombing. Then in the middle with the rearward facing seat was the Nav Plotter. Their job was to navigate the aircraft to the desired location through the use of Taycan H2S radar, Doppler navigation systems and radio compass. They were also trained to use sextants in case the other systems all failed. And then moving around to the port side is the AEO, or the Air Electronics Officer. They were in charge of the electronic defensive weapons including the ECM and chaff. They were also trained in communication such as Morse code, so that they could still communicate if the radio systems were jammed as could happen during a conflict. This guy also had a periscope that could be used to check different parts of the aircraft from the outside including that the weapons had been jettisoned. Now these three crew did not have ejector seats, so their escape was to crawl out of the entry hatch. The two outer seats did have small explosive inflatable bags that would push them out of the seats, but then it was up to them to crawl out the rest of the way. Hopefully the forward landing gear wasn't down because, as you can see, it was directly behind the hatch. The middle seat didn't actually swivel around, therefore he had to wait for either of the other two to swing around and jump out. Remember that they were wearing flight suits and parachutes, so it would have been really tight in there. Now let's move upstairs. On the left are the fast start buttons, which you could press before getting into the seat, to begin this engine start process. 
Falcons had to be in the air within four minutes because that was calculated as the time that they would have from receiving warning of an incoming Soviet nuke to the actual detonation on UK soil. What stands out is how little room there was up there. In fact, it's rumoured that it was actually designed for a single pilot before they decided that the workload would be too much and added a co-pilot. Pilots would often have their helmet touching the curved roof and the joke was that they would all have a permanent bend in their necks. Here's the four fast start buttons again, although they were eventually replaced with just a single start button. Under this is the buttons to open the bomb doors, both hydraulic and electrical as a backup, and then jettison the contents as well. There were other release buttons uh, within reach of the co-pilot and also by the rear crew as well. Here's a window to let in some fresh air. In fact, it was this one that couldn't be sealed and therefore the cabin couldn't be pressurized on XM598 on the Black Buck mission to the Falklands and that Vulcan had to return home. This material here was a remnant of a curtain that would completely black out the window to avoid the nuclear flash blinding the crew. This lever here on top released the ram air turbine electrical generator and below that was the engine fire suppression buttons. In front of the pilot were the usual displays and here is the control stick which moves with the co-pilot stick as well. What I'm showing with my hands is that it moves in a push or pull or towards the side but not a hinged movement up and down as you see with most modern control sticks. Moving into the center, you have the fuel pressures and engine parameters. This here is the release for the braking parachute, which would be deployed and then jettisoned once no longer needed. But with a strong side wind, it could actually move the nose off center, therefore you'd have to be prepared to jettison it straight away if it was doing that. Under the orange warning label was the landing gear, which was a button unlike the levers you see in aircraft these days. You could actually raise the gear on the ground in an emergency with the idea being that it would dramatically slow the aircraft if you were about to run off the runway. Here's the four engine throttles that you'll see operating later, and under this red thing is the controls for the upper and lower air brakes. And this panel here that I have folded out includes a number of controls including fuel management. This lever here is the handbrake which was definitely activated during the engine runs. The co-pilot gets a number of the same dials and on his right are controls for the lighting, air conditioning and in-air refueling. Now the two pilots do have ejector seats and they are activated by pulling on this between your legs. The whole canopy above is blown off, followed by the seat. But back here, there was also a seven person inflatable dinghy in case of a water landing, and there was a lever that could also remove the canopy other than by firing the ejection seats. Looking at these side windows, you'd have this tinting shield followed by a complete blackout. Now the crew were instructed to wear an eye patch so that in the case of an unexpected atomic flash resulting in the failure of one of their eyes, they could then flip the patch over and continue flying to drop the bomb with the other eye. This was a similar idea to covering half of the X-15 rocket plane's window so that when the ablative surface melted onto the window, they could open the cover and reveal a clean window on the other side to use to then land. And by the way, have you ever wondered what a single Vulcan engine might sound like at full throttle from the cockpit? Well, have a listen to this. And here I am crawling down after swapping to the co-pilot seat and discovering how hard it is to use a ladder with one arm and a GoPro in the other. Now going back to the ejection seats though, a jettisonable crew compartment similar to the F-111 but a lot bigger was planned but didn't eventuate, hence the less than ideal situation of the three crew having to bail out themselves. Other aircraft with two levels of crew positions, such as the B-52, actually fire the lower guys out to the underside of the aircraft. Low radar observability wasn't a consideration during the design process, although it did end up having a low radar cross section. I guess this is unsurprising when you consider that the flying wing design is similar to the B-2 Spirit South Bomber. The Vulcan was retired from active military service with the RAF in March 1984, although this aircraft continued at air shows until 2015. It remains on display with operational engines. 
Now feel free to check out my other video from the engine run and my channel for many other similar detailed tours around significant aircraft. Please give the video a thumbs up so that I know that you want more similar content. Consider subscribing and thanks for watching.